Good afternoon, everyone, or morning, or evening, or middle of the night, wherever you are. Um, for Alan, we'll talk about Alan in a minute. Um, then good middle of the night, I think, in Australia. But one way or another, it's Tuesday here in the UK, and we are going to spend the next hour, as always, working on that thing, Capture One. Um, Capture One being the raw editing software that's made from, or made by, a load of very clever people out in Copenhagen um, that allows us to take our raw footage or our raw um, images that we store from the camera through a processor, Capture One, and then hopefully spit out something that's even better than what we, uh, what we captured at the time. Because typically the raw data that we capture at the time doesn't quite match what we saw, tends to be flatter, tends to be a little bit more muted. Um, so this is a way and one of the tools that we can use to try and bring out the real depth in those images. So welcome to everyone that is a regular. That sounds like a bar. Anyway, either way. So for those of you that are regularly here, welcome. For those of you that are new here, the deal is um, you guys have sent in images that we will edit through and explain exactly how, why, and what we're doing. Um, please make this session as interactive as possible. It gets very boring if I just talk at people. So do ask questions. You can do that in the comments box, um, which is what YouTube is for. For those of you that um, don't know, there's a bit of a lag and it's just the way that live works with YouTube. So this is live-ish because there's about a sort of eight to 10 second lag, which means when you put a comment in, I may not see it instantly. I'm not ignoring you. It just hasn't popped up on my screen yet. So don't worry. We will get to as many as we can. Um, so if we've got questions, then please do put them in. Um, before we get started with the actual editing, there's a few other things. Um, and I'm going to disappear off the screen for a second just to explain something. So uh, we've had a couple of questions and a couple of emails come in over the last few weeks about how do I know when the next one of these sessions, so these editing Capture One sessions, is up. Number one, you will find them on the YouTube channel. So if you're, well, you are now watching on YouTube, right? So, so what way are we there? So down there, somewhere down there, um, is a little um, button that says either subscribe or there's a little bell. Um, subscribing to the channel is one thing, but if you click the little bell, it'll notify you when we're going live. We also put in the playlist on this channel, the next live date. So that will go in there a couple of days after we do the existing one. And if you go to the website, so our website, so paulreefer.com, go to workshops and then go to live online sessions, you'll see a handy little countdown timer that should say zero uh, if you're watching this live, um, but that will tell you when the next session is. Now, all of those things we put up at the end of these sessions, um, but many of you don't make it to that end card. So if you are on Instagram, YouTube, web, Facebook, Twitter, what's the other one? Oh, email, whatever. Those are the ways of seeing when we're next doing this um, and also getting in touch. So please do use them because there's, there's a reason that we update them so that you know what's coming up. That's the idea. Right, capture one. Um, so a couple of things um, from a software point of view. Um, oh, I said we'd talk about Alan. Alan is leaving us. He's not really leaving us. So Alan from Australia has to, he's going to get a special mention now. So he's decided to try some new tools and actually... Great, genuinely great. So these sessions are obviously dedicated to editing in Capture One. But Capture One is one of many different tools out there. We teach um, for workshops. We've got clients that, you know, I'll, I'll teach one-to-one -one in Lightroom. We'll teach one-to-one -one in DxO Raw. We'll, we'll do stuff in even, you know, Canon, um, Canon's own processing software and an Adobe Camera Raw and everything in between. How you choose to edit your photos, completely up to you. This is one of the software options that are out there. Um, it happens to be the one that I use for most of um, most of my work, but of course there are others there. The principles, however, that we're going to talk through, so the way that we edit things, although some of the tools may be different, the principles are always going to be the same. So you are welcome to follow along with whatever software you've got. I can't always help you live um, in, in what the equivalent is. But as long as you understand why we're doing something, actually you become less dependent on what the tool is because you understand the reasoning rather than understanding the tool. So the tool that we are in for today is Capture One. Capture One as it stands, as of right now recording, is on 16.2.1. So that's Capture One 23, which is the year. And if you go to the About box up there, that's the one, you will see... Um, that we've got on there 16.2.1 and then the Mac or PC version. Um, for those of you that don't remember, there was a bit of a licensing change. So if you have a perpetual license and you bought it after February this year, 
If you bought a version that was prior to 16.2, I don't believe you get that bundled in included with your perpetual license because you chose to buy a license of a version that was stuck at that point in time. If you're on a subscription, you should be on this version. That's what you're paying for. You're paying Capture One money every month or every year to keep up to date. So please do keep up to date if you can. Uh, if you are on a perpetual license from a previous version or from you know this, this version 16.1 or whatever, you've got the option, go into your account and you can choose to upgrade. Why should you upgrade? Well, in 16.2, there was quite a lot of new stuff. So for a start, you had all of that new camera support. Um, so if you've got one of those cameras, unfortunately, this is the way it goes with this software, um, the camera support depends on the version. So if you've got a brand new camera, chances are you're going to need a brand new version to be able to support it. So yeah, but that's kind of a that's, that's kind of a given, but obviously it's one of the things to consider when you're planning on buying new kit. Uh, the other thing though is there's a load of new features in 16.2 as it was and 2.1 was a service release for some new cameras. So in there, wireless tethering for Fuji cameras. So if you are either in a studio or out on location, you want to wirelessly tether from your camera into Capture One to see on the big screen, you can now do that with certain um, Fujifilm cameras, not all. Face focus. So we've got the ability now, um, when you import into Capture One, it'll zoom in um, onto the face. So for, if you're a wedding photographer or portrait photographer, you can check the eyes, the smile, the sharpness and whatever before bringing it in to Capture One. So you're saving yourself time in that workflow. We're going to talk about it today, but auto dust removal. It's a beta or beta, depending on where you live. Um, hit and miss sometimes. Some people are reporting good results. Some people not so impressed. We'll talk about it um, today and I'll give you some examples. Um, custom shortcuts, which actually is, is sort of glossed over. We're going to cover that today as well, because that is actually a, a big deal um, for, for some of the uh, some of the workflows that are out there. Um, and then we've got the integration with Frameio or Frameio, as some people will, will call it. Um, so this is about collaboration. This is about extending your workflow. So kind of like Capture One Live, you could get out to external parties. Um, this is this is one of, I'm sure, many integrations that will happen in future. Um, to allow uh, you to do whatever you're doing in your workflow, whether you're in the field or in a studio, and share it with other creatives that are on that job. There's other stuff. So user experience, I've got it in there listed. You can read. You don't need me to read it for you. But one thing that is very much true is the preview generation is faster. Um, I'm noticing it. So I think the numbers were something like 27% for a certain um, setup, I think, for Mac, and then some bigger amount for, for PC. The preview generation has got faster, for sure. Um, and that's that's a notable difference. So if you're on 16.1 or 16 or 15 or whatever, and you have the option or the choice to upgrade, that's the reason why. Up to you whether or not you do. <laughs> um, speaking of things like subscriptions, uh, at the moment, remember public service announcement. Um, Capture One launched last month, I think from memory, all in one, which is their new monthly option for subscription. It's a more expensive option than just the standalone application, but it includes iPad, iPhone, when that's released soon, shortly, um, Capture One Live, uh, and the big winner, winner for most people was priority support. So you've got your support time reduced quite significantly. If you sign up to that before the end of June, there's 15% off for the first year. After June, it goes back to normal. So for those of you that are looking at it, do the maths yourselves, work out what it, what works out for you, but that's the option between now um, and what is that, 24 days time. Finally, I think it's finally before we get into Capture One, um, Elevation. So we produced Elevation Styles, you'll find the link in the description down below. Um, these are a style pack and we'll talk about styles in a second as one of the um, shortcuts. Um, we're going to do some more work on them um, in the future. So originally we launched Elevation in version 22. We introduced some brand new styles. We added to the pack um, for existing users. We may add to the pack again for existing users. Um, so keep an eye on that because those styles are growing um, and they're growing with each version that we release out there. So have a look. Um, you can find all that in the links that are down below and, and captureone.com and all that sort of stuff. So that's it. Public service announcements done for today. Um, we could talk about Apple stuff yesterday, but at the moment, I'm not quite ready to do um, editing into thin air. We'll get there pretty soon, I'm sure. Um, so, Capture One. 
Alan, you are late to class and you missed, unfortunately, the eulogy I did. It was it was particularly moving. Um, but you can watch that back later on. <laughs> anyway, um, so we said we'd talk about the dust spot removal because actually for specifically for me in, in my genre and for a lot of you, and that's probably why you're watching, um, when it comes to landscape photography, dust spots are a nightmare. Um, especially if you don't clean your lens. And quite a lot of you send in images, raw images, with very unclean lenses, let's call it that. Um, or sensors, doesn't matter. Either way, it's still a dust spot. Um, so, because it's the bane of people's lives to a massive extent, um, if you think about the progression, so there was originally dust spot removal. Originally, for dust spots, you used to have to use a clone tool um, for, for lots of pieces of software for, for many, many years. Uh, Capture One's had a dust spot removal tool in it for a long, long time, um, certainly since I can remember. Um, and that tool was pretty basic. It's still up here. Um, so up on the toolbar here, you've got remove spot and remove dust now as they are because they're, they're sort of separated out. Um, but this removal function here, it literally just gives you a little um, circle and we can change the size of the spot that we want to remove. And it does a bit of an averaging around the area and it tries to fill it in. Um, it's pretty basic, pretty rudimentary. Sometimes it gets it right. Sometimes you can see it's been done. But then evolved a better healing approach because Capture One for a long time, and some of you may remember this, when you were doing healing, if I wanted to, I don't know, let's say, let's pretend we've got a massive dust spot. So this one here is a dust spot. If I want to get rid of it, I would choose my source area and I could heal. Now, the problem with the healing brush originally was you could only have one source and one location per layer. And Capture One has a limit of 16 layers. So you could only really, if you wanted to choose different locations to take things from, you could only have 16 healing points. So the Dust Spot tool was a much better option than that. I think you could allow, I think, up to 99. Um, but the healing brush, in uh, the latest healing brush that came along, you've now got a new world. In fact, let's just... Uh, where it's automatic... In terms of play, I'm choosing an origin just to prove the point. But on a single layer, I've got all of these different points and I could fix dust spots all over the place. Wonderful. Still a lot of clicking though, isn't it? And actually it gets to become pretty frustrating. Now, we're looking at this picture here. It's of Zion National Park. Doesn't look particularly troublesome, right? Um, there are some dust spots here. But what I notice with a lot of people is when they look at it on the screen, they go, yeah, it's okay. When they look at it in print, they then see all these spots appearing and it's like, what happened? So for a long time now, I've advocated having, let's just create a field adjustment layer, one of two ways to see a dust spot. One is using a curve, so we can create, sorry, a curve, and I call mine rainbow splat, just to prove the point. This curve is basically a huge, great big sine wave. You can see that there. And what that does is it shifts contrast massively from, from minor values to major values. And you can see up here, everything that looks now like a dust spot is a dust spot. Um, and you can see the sheer scale of the problem on this image. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Now, this is a hundred and I think actually this is an old image. So it's about a hundred megapixels. Um, so it's not the end of the world, but there's an awful lot of dust spots on this image. So to get rid of them, and if I turn this layer off, you can see the major ones, but the minor ones aren't quite so obvious, which is why we have this layer. It lets me see the minor ones. Now, there's another way of doing this, which is we create a new filled layer. And because dust spots are hidden in subtle contrast, what we can do is use the tools that allow us to play with subtle contrast to their maximum extent. So if I push clarity all the way up, structure maybe all the way up, I could even use dehaze if I wanted to. We could whack in a little bit of contrast. And, and if you look on the channel under Pro Tips, you'll see a dust spot removal video. It's about a, I don't know, eight or nine minute video. It will show you all of this. And you can save this as a, as a style that you can put onto every machine, like every image. Now, this isn't the finished image, of course, and you wouldn't edit on this layer. This layer is temporary. But it shows you where all these dust spots are without necessarily having to put the rainbow thing up. But the rainbow thing, some people prefer the rainbow thing. Some people prefer the contrast thing. Either way, it doesn't matter. We can see those dust spots. So let's go to our background layer, because this is just a layer on top of the background. 
and let's use our dust spot tool. So I'm going to click up here and go to go to remove spot or in fact remove dust it's the right answer uh, and I'm going to make this nice and small and we're going to click there does a good job click there does a good job does a good job good 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 but and I'm hoping I'm really hoping you guys can see this on on YouTube but if I move my mouse off so we don't see those little cursors anymore so there they are I want you to take a look a close look at this area here so you see these two blobs that's the dust spot removal tool and if I were to turn oh, I can't because I didn't do it on a layer did I <laughs> so I'm going to go move background adjustments to a new layer right and I'm now going to turn off oh I can't being an idiot because the dust spot layer unfortunately is on the background layer but the point being, let me just move this out of the way. Even though that has, in theory, removed this dot, removed the dust spot, what it hasn't done is made it blend in. Because if you look closely, you've got these sort of subtle... I think you can see this on YouTube. You've got these sort of subtle rings, and it's where it smoothed out that area, another one here. And if I were to turn on one of my two dust spot layers, so this one's the one at the moment that's doing a lot of the, the clarity stuff, I can't see that there turn it on and i can see the difference likewise if i do the rainbow layer that's the photo turn it on i can see where it did that stuff i can see these little bullet holes so it it is a tough one it's a tough call um because it does a decent job but it's not really good enough um and I'm just going to get rid of those very quickly because I don't want to change any adjustments on the rest of it. And this is why we started to shift to the healing brush. So the healing brush, let me turn on my dust spot finder layer. And we're going to go back to this layer here. The healing brush allows me to do it in a more subtle way. So I'm going to make sure that I've got a much smaller area here and say source to there, source to there. Oh, didn't do such a good job up there. That's interesting. Oh, no, it did. It's just trying to catch up. So you can see in here that the healing brush does generally a better job at getting rid of those dust spots. If I turn that rainbow layer on again, we can't actually see where those dust spots were. It's done a much better job of removing those um, those spots. I've just seen, you, someone's just said the screen is frozen, and it has. And I don't understand why, because it hasn't frozen on my end and I haven't frozen. Uh, what is that about? Let's, um... so you can see me. That's weird, isn't it? Um... Let's put a comment up and we'll talk about it while I'm trying to work that out. So, yes, Michael, it does look like smudges. Um, what on earth is going on there? Let's just go back to there. There we go. Don't know what that was going on there. But, yes, Michael, to your point, yes, they look like smudges. Um, using the healing brush, which you would have seen if the screen hadn't frozen. Sorry. Um, let's just make sure you can actually see where they were. So, here is the heel layer. And you can see on there where those healing oops, sorry, where those healing points are. And if I turn this off, there they are, there's the dots. And on, they're now gone. Let's turn that rainbow layer on so it makes it obvious. So that's with the hip dust spots gone. That's with the dust spots there. The healing brush does a much better job at fixing dust spots than the dust spot tool. The irony. There we go. So Going back to our point about the dust spot automatic removal tool, here's the challenge. Let's just go back to all of these different layers. I'm just going to turn all these off. In fact, I'm going to leave the rainbow one on. Okay, I'm going to create a new field layer. And let's turn off our rainbow. And we're going to go to our new tool under here. Well, I've put it under here um, in my details tab. Dust removal, you'll see it there, and it says dust removal beta. Um, you can choose whether it's removing dust or spots. 
So we're going to leave it as dust and say, remove all that dust, please. Click the button. Now, let's think about that. It's just gone through a 100 megapixel image and it's removed all the dust spots. Great. But has it? Because I can see bullet holes where it's done the job and it's where it's done the job with the dust spot tool. It's also missed some. So let's just turn off that rainbow. So there's without our dust spot um, fixing and that's with our dust spot fixing. Now the problem is, let me just clone this actually. So to do it with and without, um, we are going to reset that one. Right, so there's with the dust spot fixing. And there's without. So it has fixed this one, this one, this one, this one, but it's left bullet holes. It has not fixed this one, this one, this one, and this one. So A, where it is successful, it's leaving some remnants behind. Look at these here. B, it's not actually getting all the dust spots yet. Now, why am I saying this? So, so you know, I think Capture One's a great tool. So why, why am I showing you where it doesn't do it great? The reason I'm showing you that is because this is actually a beta. And this is the whole point. So you've wanted, as users, and I've wanted for a long time, Capture One to release things for us to have a look at and play with and whatever, and to flag them when they're a beta. This is very much one of those. It's even in the program. Dust removal, beta. Very clear. So if you've got a few little dust spots somewhere, will Capture One get rid of them compared to this? Yeah, it will. Let's have a look. So look at all these dust spots that were there in the first place. And I'm remember, I'm, I'm exaggerating them by using a rainbow curve so you can see them in the sky. Is that better than that? Yes, it is. The problem that I have is the technology it's using isn't the healing technology, it's the dust spot technology, which always used to leave those little bullet points or bullet marks or the little sort of smudges in the sky. The second is it's not seeing all those dust spots. So while this is a manual effort and I hate it, I'm still going to, for now, just make sure I'm checking everything manually after I've done it. Will this get better? Of course it will. Um, and if I look at this image here, so this is the one, let's just zoom in, this is the one with the dust spots. This is the one that the tool's been through. And yeah, it's left one there and one there, but it's left an awful lot less for me to deal with than was there in the first place. So is it better? Yes. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. And it's not perfect for a couple of little issues, but they're things that the guys are still working on. So hopefully it's one where, for those of you that are using it, genuinely feedback when when stuff goes right and wrong send the raw files into capture one um let them let them see what you're seeing uh, because then they can try and fix it you know this is a pretty good start it's not there yet um and it needs a bit more work in this case i have seen examples of a portrait for example where it's done a great job of removing the the three issues that were on that shot brilliant um but quite often for a lot of us landscape people <laughs> Our, our lenses go from two modes. One, when we've cleaned the sensor and the lens, to be fair, it's perfectly clean, and then it goes to perfectly covered in every single piece of dirt and dust out there, and unfortunately, there's never really an in-between. So because of that, you may want to just check. Use the dust removal tool, so use the remove dust button, but then still, I would advocate, either use a high contrast layer or your magic little rainbow curve, to be able to see what it's left behind, because you might find that it's left a few more behind than you were expecting. Um, so with that said, let's just go through uh, a couple things. Um, so uh, where are we? Uh, Paula, why well, I think the current perpetual license model is unsustainable. The dust spot removal tool is appealing, yes, but upgrading my license now would mean I'm stuck with the beta version until I upgrade again. Yeah, well, it depends on whether or not it's updated in 16.2.2, if you see what I mean. So the, the way that the, the new perpetual licenses work is the anything that's the first point is what you're stuck with. So if they have 16.2 and that's what you bought, 16.2.1 is included, 0.2 is included, 0.3, 0.4, 0.5, whatever. The second it goes to 16.3, that's a different one. That's an upgrade. So yes, the, the, the perpetual license model, you've got to think about whether you want to go down that road and when you want to get off the track, as it were. Um, 
so Michael, the curve with the dust scanner is so helpful in finding spots. Yeah. So the whether or not, so there's two ways of doing it. One, as I said, we can put in this huge, great big uh, ramping curve that allows us to see huge contrast shifts um, in very, very flat areas. That's what I think Michael was talking about. Um, the other is that we put in um, clarity structure contrast and drop down some brightness so we can see it in the real photo itself. If you have a look on, let's say, on our pro tips thing, there's one about how to create that other layer. It's one of the most useful layers that I use when we're editing photos because I can go through the first thing I go through is just clean up the image. Um, I, I challenge you to show me a camera that doesn't have a few dust spots after after more than a day's use. Um, Paula, onion rings. I like that. Yeah, we'll stick with it. These look like onion rings. They do. Um, and it's annoying because they, they, I don't know what's worse, the dust spot or the onion ring. Either way. Um, it's not quite, not quite there um, at this point. Um, Bruno got stuck. The screen got stuck when it showed the smudges. Maybe that was just Capture One saying it didn't want to show you that it couldn't do it properly. I don't know. Um, so where are we next? We'll just check through. Uh, Michael, if there are too many dust spots, you can just replace the sky. It's true. Um, why bother worrying about what this guy looked like? You can just change it for a new one later. Um, and yes, Paul, you are perfectly correct. Filters are um, one of the biggest dangers of, of catching dust spots. You can spend all your time cleaning your sensor, all the time cleaning the back, remember, and front element of your lens, and then you go and put a dirty filter over the front of it. If you're shooting with a relatively wide aperture, you typically won't see a dust spot on the filter. It's just too close. Um, you'll lose a little bit of, of image quality, but you, you won't typically see a dust spot. If you're shooting out at f16, you're going to see everything from that filter and, and beyond. So yeah, be, be really careful. Uh, other Michael, how do you get the rainbow curve? So all you do, just very quickly, number one, just watch the uh, other pro tips ones and it'll, it'll cover it. And I think we covered it in a previous one of these before, but I'll show you anyway, just quickly. So what you do is, and you can save this as a style, you would create a new filled layer. And all you're going to do is drag up and down and up and down on your curve tool until you get, you know, between, oops, between six and eight ups and six and eight downs, something like that. Whoops, I'm not doing this very well for demo. And what you'll find is as you're doing that, you're getting huge, great big variations especially in areas like bright sky. Um, and that will show any dust spots that are there. Each one of these you do will be slightly different. Um, but I just then, once that's done, you'd go to here and you would save it as a custom preset. I saved mine as rainbow splat, but you know, up to you. Um, and then you can apply that to any layer. Remember, don't make the changes on this layer. So don't do the healing or, or any any changes in, in terms of... Um, I don't know, contrast or, or anything like that on this layer because you're actually editing the rainbow layer. You don't want that. Um, you want to edit a layer below it and just use this layer as a way of seeing what's um, what's there. Um, where are you? I think I think we've covered. I think Prasad's covered something about Paula's Fuji question. So cool. We will move on to one of your images. If that's everything with dust spots. So, in summary, dust spot removal tool. Great idea. Great direction. Good attempt at sort of implementation number one, but as flagged by Capture One themselves, it's still very much a beta version of it. It's not got everything. It's It still relies on some manual checking for sure and a lot of stuff in between. So just you know, take it for what it is. Use it. Feedback to them. Um, especially the best thing you can do with, with Capture One is help them by sending them RAWs where it works great or RAWs where it doesn't work so great um, so they can start playing with it and, and understanding the use cases. So, Igor or Igor, I'm not sure which one it is. I'm going to go with Igor for this, and apologies if it's wrong. Um, so, question in from Igor on this raw image, and this is in the IP that's already been edited, so I'll just do a before and after. If you want a before and after on your image, either go to the before and after tool up here. If it's not up there, go to Customize Toolbar, and you can drag it up. And have it back on. In fact, for some reason, my guides button has disappeared. It keeps doing that. For those of you that have been on here a while, you'll notice my guides keeps disappearing, even though my workspace is um, saved. A bit weird. Um, so, how to keep 
question. The glow of the sun warm, the shadow of the interior lightened up, and the sea blue. Um, and we've got this as a sort of a reference image, so much bluer sea, um, warmer, warmer sky out there and shadow there. And this is the shot here that after some existing edits, um, we've got... And you can see it, actually. Look at this water here. It goes from a sort of a bluey grey to more of a magenta grey or yellow grey. Um, you know, the, the sky has got a lot warmer, but in doing that, look at this sun. We've got a bit of a challenge there with some, some clarity that's maybe crept in a bit too much. And the overall, th the whole thing is sort of turned as sort of an orangey pink, um, whereas maybe it wasn't quite that much in certain areas. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot one thing. We are going to... We're gonna, um, Go back to something. Um, the custom shortcuts. Sorry, I said we we're going to go through that. So I'm going to use Igor's um, example, actually, just as as an example of this. So I mentioned uh, elevation styles. So here's a perfect example of custom shortcuts. If you constantly use a similar style, not necessarily um, at import, but maybe you're always using a, a style um, that's yours. Let's say I always use golden hour um, shadow recovery. That's that one. Okay. As of 16.2, we've got the ability to right click and assign it a shortcut. So this applies to a lot of different things within Capture One, but I can assign that shortcut and under my, as long as I have a custom shortcut set, which I do, but you can create your own if not, apply style golden hour. And I can say that's going to be command eight. Okay. Close that down. Let's create a new variant of this one. And without doing anything in terms of going into any tab, Command-8, and I've just applied the Golden Hour style. So this is a very, very good enough. Don't get me wrong, I've applied it on an image that we probably, we probably wouldn't apply it to, but you get the idea. We can very, very quickly set up our own now, and it actually tells you in your styles list um, which ones the, the command applies to very quickly you can get to a place if you know that you edit in a certain way um and you know that you use maybe the same two or three styles quite often set them up as shortcuts you can now do that it will show you what the shortcut is and you can then go through your browser and just literally you know command eight command nine command seven command command o or whatever i'll well, do something else but you can set your own custom command now for styles but you can also and here's the fun one um if I go into Edit Keyboard Shortcuts under the Edit menu, I can also change my Edit With and Open Widths to include shortcuts. So if I want to say Other, and let's just choose Photoshop 23. So I can now edit with Adobe Photoshop 23 and put in Command 7, Close. So rather than now having to go into here, and then, oops, sorry, right click edit with and choose it i could just now hit command seven and it will edit it'll load up photoshop edit in it and save the tiff file back into the catalog that i'm working on so the the shortcut thing the, the custom shortcuts for styles and open with and edit with it sounds like such a minor thing but trust me i haven't stopped using the edit with shortcut because if i think about it that's what i do when i've finished in capture one i wanted to make the final little changes it's an edit in photoshop so why not shortcut it? And you can now in 16.2. Same with styles. If I know I'm always going to use the same style going through, then just set up a shortcut. Choose the style, set up the shortcut, and, and it'll apply um, when you press it. Um, where are we? Anthony, sorry, there's a question. Uh, I want to get a couple a couple of new Max desktop on a laptop. What specs for the foreseeable future would consider as bare minimum for smooth operation? Four, four terabytes notwithstanding. So honestly, the more and more stuff that we do on cloud, the less storage you need. So the four terabyte thing, yeah, it, it's up to you. It's up to your way of working. I have um, network storage and stuff, so the, the local storage isn't quite so important, but you know, up, up, up to you. Um, what I run with, to give you an idea, and, and I'm conscious of yesterday's announcement. So, um, this the, the studio that we're currently using is an M1 Ultra, I think. Um, I think we're on 128 um, gig of RAM and, and whatever else. You don't generally need that level of spec unless you are doing things like, like we demo sometimes. So, 
If you're focus stacking 20, 150 meg images, then yes, you're going to push that system. If you're doing 3D animation, you're going to push it. If you're doing 8K streams, you're going to push it. For a laptop spec, I would say either the 14 or the 16 inch. Um, the new 15 inch Air is a great laptop itself, but you know, 14 and 16 inch Pros are great. Um, with the system on a chip, so the M series stuff, 32 gig is perfectly adequate. In fact, 16 gig is equally adequate for most activities and tasks. 64, it will fly and it will probably buy you a couple of years of extra use out of it. And the thing with Mac now, whether it's a laptop or a desktop, it's the same system chips. It's the same unified memory setup. So I would say you know, whatever spec you've got, left or laptop or desktop, you can get the equivalent um, in a portable or, or desktop version. Um, so would I buy an M1 Studio right now? Probably not, because the M2 Studio um, is, is going to supersede that. Um, there's a debate over form factor versus performance in terms of the 15-inch Air that's just come out. But you've now got options, a 14-inch, a 15-inch, and a 16-inch, and actually a 13-inch, all with um, M2 chips. Um, they all do a great job. I, my entire workflow is using that stuff now, um, and it's, it's pretty cool. There's a question that's open in my mind as to how much faster the Mac Pro with Apple Silicon will be, um, but that's, that's for us to play with and see. Um, where are we? Rick, when using a shortcut, does it automatically put it to a new layer? Uh, well, it does, but not because of the shortcut. It does because whenever I apply a style, as of version 23, remember, this changed in, in 23, if I apply this, it applies it to a new layer that I can turn on, off, I can adjust the opacity to. So, yes, it does. But it's not because of the shortcut key, it's because that's what styles do now. They always go on to a new layer. Um, right. I think we're all done. We're going into a weird hardware discussion, so you, you can carry on with that. I'm going to edit this picture. Right, so uh, back to Igor's point. This, I'm going to just pick on this shot here. So this is one of his edits. Um, now, it's all about here, right? So let's look at the layers that Igor's already put on. Reflection. Well, it's just getting rid of some of that down there. This unnamed one is just darkening these parts of the post here. That's fine. The sun, well, that's just almost, I think that's a negative clarity. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's actually smoothing the sun out so we don't get that, that clear bead. So you see this bit here, that's the result of too much clarity. I'll just remove the golden hour ones out of it. Um, but that beading in there is the result of everything being too defined. So what Igor's done is put in another layer here. I can press M for the mask to see it. So over the sun, we put the clarity down to minus 100, which should smooth out all of that contrast. Inside the window, so this layer is all of the scenery. Um, now that layer itself is doing little tweaks of highlights and shadows and all that sort of stuff. Um, but it's not doing much else. I mean, there's a little bit of color balance going on to try and sort of fix, I think, to try and fix the blue, but it's not quite um, doing the job. Uh, and then we've got the window frame itself, and that's just a, an HDR. It's about pulling up exposure. So if I look at the tasks that Eagle's worried about, the inside of the frame I'm actually okay with because if the goal was to lift that up, this layer does it pretty well. What you'll notice is all the sliders are relatively subtle. You know, you've moved up exposure by two thirds of a stop. It's not up by three stops or anything crazy like that. It's not HDR'd. It's just lifting it a bit. A bit more contrast, because sometimes when you lift exposure, it sort of it looks like it's washed out. Um, reduce the saturation. Again, because as we lift stuff up, it looks like it feels like it's become more saturated, so we can knock that back. And then lifting up the shadows a little bit, lifting up the back a little bit. I don't think no, there's no curve or anything in there. A little bit of clarity, a little bit of structure. That's what I would have done on this frame and it's done a good job it's this inside window layer that i think is the problem and it's a problem for two reasons so there's actually a luma range on here which means it excludes the sun so if i go to display mask you can see it's excluding that i'm going to tell it not to um because if this is truly an inside window layer it should be applying to everything inside the window. I could have a separate mountain layer, but just logically, we'll just leave that as inside the window in, in general. 
So with our inside window layer, as it were, let's just go in and, and look at the color balance stuff. So the shadows have gone to be more green, a little lighter. That's what's happening here with this hill. So if I were to pull the shadows, their darkness down, so I can still keep it green. In fact, we can go even more lush green if we want to. But what I am going to do is pull this slider here, the brightness of the shadows specifically, just down a little bit. And we're going to leave it so that we've still got that nice, deep, rich contrast outside the window. This area here, if you're ever trying to work out whether something's a mid-tone, a highlight, or a shadow, just move your mouse over it. So the sky up here, 245, and I'm reading these numbers at the top of the screen. So the sky is very much a highlight, obviously. This area here, 160, well, out of 0 to 255, that's sort of in the mid-tone. If I pull up the histogram, you'll see the orange bar moving around, and anything pretty much around this area here is a mid-tone. So the C is in the mid-tones. Maybe the upper mid-tones, but it's definitely there. So these mid-tones I could pull to be more blue. And that's that's all we've done. Literally, we go from there to there because these are all mid-tones. And up here, this is the highlights area. So in the highlights, it's almost like everything that Eagle's done in here, I would say it's probably the right call. It's just it may need to be done a bit more. Um, that's all. So pushing those highlights and the, the color grading to be warmer in that sense um if i go to my yellows you know we can pull up a bit of saturation or even pull it down on that sun it's not a bad idea pull down that lightness and we get to a place where actually we've gone from it being not so blue to being very blue just be careful with this though so this is the one thing i would sort of put a warning flag on the color of the light that you've got will have affected the color of the water, the reflections of it, the sky, everything like that. And that comes from this warm sunshine. I would be really, really hesitant to push it any more than this. This is probably the limit, because if I start making that water completely blue, it doesn't make sense in our heads. Because I've got warm golden light coming from the sun. It's clearly sunset. Why would the water be that sort of crystal blue if, if I'm looking at the reflection of the light coming from it? What I might want to do instead is take this layer. So here's a little fun one. So this layer is called Inside Window. I am going to create a new layer, and I'm going to call it Sky Inside Window. Right-click, copy the mask from Inside Window. So I've now got a new layer. And I'm then going to delete everything that's not the sky. Makes sense, right? This is the layer for the sky. So let's soften that layer out completely so we don't notice this deletion so much. So we're now only dealing with the sky. And I've done it quite roughly, but you get the idea. With the sky and the sky alone, I'm going to pull down. Now look at this stuff up here. It's really, really bright. It's the whites. So if I pull down white, I can get some of that color back in the sky. But look at this sun, it's starting to do that weird thing when we're getting the uh, the margins around it. So again, back to my eraser. And I'm just going to get rid of that. And we're going to blend in with maybe a lower opacity up to that sky. So I've darkened the top of the sky, including the sun. Realize that I'm now getting that weird ring around the sun. So we're then going to blend in. If you look at my mask in grayscale, you'll see what we've done. We've blended the impact of that big pull down of whites. We could do it in, in um, highlights as well, like that. But just, again, don't push it too much. That's the other problem to bear in mind. Um, but that allows us to just recover some of that golden glow that's around the horizon at sunset without affecting the sun and without affecting the sea, just by using the same, um, same tool. And Powell, yes. <laughs> A duplicate layer function would be really useful because that's effectively what I've just done, except it didn't actually duplicate the layer because it didn't take any adjustments. But what would be good, yes, if I could right click on a layer and say duplicate this and it takes all the adjustments and the mask and creates another layer from it. In this case, it actually helped me because I didn't really want to take any of the adjustments. I wanted to start from fresh, but I don't disagree with the sentiment. <laughs> so we go from something that sort of looked there 
I don't know why we keep getting that weird um, lens correction there. From there to there. Now, if that was the... Sorry, where are we? There. Um, if the goal was to do exactly that, let's get the sea looking more blue while keeping the sun looking nice and warm, I think that ticks the box. I think there is uh, something to be said for... This is the sun layer here, that one that, that sort of reduces all the clarity. To me, it's not done it enough. So I'm going to create another layer and say Sun 2 Clarity. Because remember, you can stack Clarity layers. So let's just do that and 100% flow and go like that. And then we'll do another bigger one and say only half opacity and go that. You can probably understand why, because it gives me a much softer spread in two stages. And I'm going to double down on that clarity. Now, no, actually, it's a bit too much, maybe. We could also do a little bit of contrast adjustment just to reduce it. Um, maybe up the saturation just a touch. This is now your choice. So how far you want to push it is up to you. But that gives us you know, a clearer um, view of the sun. You could, in this particular instance, take those whites of the sun and really push them up. And I would argue, and we've talked about this in previous weeks, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to see a bit of flare, especially if we're shooting into the sun. And there is an argument that says that looks less natural than that, especially if I push a bit of saturation and maybe even warm it up a little bit to there. To me, that almost looks more real, personally, than just using negative clarity alone. But again, personal choice. So shadows from the inside, I'd leave them as they are. Igor, they look perfectly fine. The outside window, if you're going to have something that is the outside the window layer, make sure it is everything outside the window. Just from a mental point of view, it keeps things really simple and clean when you're making changes. <clears throat> you didn't need to exclude the mountain in order to leave it dark. All you needed to do was go into your color editor Let's go back to the inside window. Go to your color editor and on your shadows, rather than leaving this up like that, we're just going to pull the shadows back down and that just hones in on this um, this mountain with the forest. And then the final bit, that sky, you know, yes, we so we've shifted the midtones. The, the sea was very much in the midtones. How do we know it's in the midtones? Well, because as I move my mouse around it, it's telling me up the top, 142 luminosity. Roughly halfway between zero and two five five. That's a midtone. So by changing those midtones to be much bluer, you get the blue in the sea, and then a separate sky attack. Um, and again, it's up to you. That's as it was as you'd had it originally with the clarity. That's where I would go with it and actually boost that sun because I don't want to see you know, this stuff here. It's really quite scraggly. Um, I, photographically I'm, I'm not sure it, it does the job this to me just feels so much more real more natural more authentic um, especially when I compare the two side by side so if you are shooting into the sun don't be afraid to let the sun flare it's it's what it's done one other thing you might want to have checked um, just for your own reference more than anything is your sorry your original ICC profile um, for this Sony, you've only got the generic one. In other cameras, you would have had potentially a pro standard profile to load in. That might have been a good place to start because it, it possibly would have done a, a cleaner job with the sun to start with. But that's where I would get to personally. Uh, I'm just going to flag that uh, to send you back. But um, otherwise, if I go before and after from there to there, looks pretty good. Nice. Uh, Mark, um, so I think from memory, this is Death Valley. I think you mentioned, um, so this makes me uncomfortable <laughs> as, a, as a picture for purely one reason. And I don't, I don't know whether I'm just oversensitive to it, but when I see green skies, they make me uncomfortable, um, because the sky can be pink, the sky can be purple, the sky can be blue, the sky can be yellow, it can be orange, it can be red, it can be all of those things. The one thing I've never personally seen in the sky is green. 
Um, I have seen bluish green sometimes in certainly storms, for example, they, where they go from sort of blue to gray. There's a little bit of a slight tint of green within there. But this to me is a green sky. And if I go back to before, it wasn't really green. It was more gray. And if I look at these two between them, it, the the issue is quite pronounced when I look at before and after, and it's why I'm a huge fan of using before and after. It allows you to just keep doing the reset, keep checking on yourselves. Uh, have I gone too far? Have I shifted colors maybe a, a slightly different way? Um, just keep using that before and after to check with every layer where you're at. When I tried to sort of dissect this in terms of where that came in from, so sky high, that's up here. There's a little bit of change in there. Sky and Mountain, quite a lot of change in that one. Um, foreground, less of an issue, just raising up the, the brightness of the foreground. Um, the global adjustment layer has an effect, but it's not particularly huge in here. It still remains. And there's a healing layer, I'm guessing, for these dust spots, which disappear. Um, <laughs> good point, Powell. Um, you are right. It is possible to have a green sky when it's at night time and we're looking at the aurora. Fair point. Well caught. Um, however, in a normal daytime and with a rainbow, it's, it's not quite there. So, uh, but yes, you're right. Caught out. Um, it is possible to see a green sky, but generally they're called northern lights. So in absence of the northern lights hitting Death Valley, what I think has happened here, and just so that you're all on the same page, this isn't about making the sky green. What I think has happened is... Mark's use of some of the tools has exaggerated a slight tint that was already in the image. So if I were to right-click and clone this and turn off, for example, this sky and mountain layer, you see how it improves a little bit. Well, so let's have a look. What, what's sky and mountain doing? Because it's not changing the white balance, strangely. Um, so the, the shot white balance is, is that. I'm guessing it's probably on auto white balance, so that's what the camera thought was there. Just go to there. Camera probably got this about right. You know, that everything's pretty neutral, um, but there is a little tint of, of green in there. So then I go into the color um, tab and think, right, well, it's not grading because there's no change there. Weird. It's not in our basic tab. There's no change there. Ah, there we are. So. When I started looking for where this could be, it was actually in one of the most unusual places, which is in the advanced color tab. If I were to reset this tab temporarily, so hold down the option key to temporarily reset stuff and click, you see it goes more neutral and let go and it goes back. And then we can go through each of these colors. So this sort of magenta color is having an effect on here of boosting it, but that boost feels unnatural it really does the saturation is just too much um, it doesn't go that pink um, in terms of rock happy to um, reduce the lightness of it but it's, it's not quite there the blues well that's a really subtle change I'm going to leave it for the sake of it um, the beiges well it's pushing this cloud a little bit again with that saturation everything seems to have its saturation boosted as a general rule, if you're going to boost every single side of the color wheel saturation, you're better off using the saturation tool that's in your sliders and your exposure tab. So this one, because this tool will ramp it and it will protect over saturating colors. That's the other thing to bear in mind. So whereas this won't, this will let you go to your heart's content and, and keep going. So, you know, the blues have been saturated up. I, I get that. It's the sky. You want to make it you know, a bit more bit more punchy but here here we go look at this the green so the green in the rainbow makes sense to try and saturate that but this mask isn't just on the rainbow it's on the whole of that background so if i turn this off we lose some of that boost in there and everything is sort of a bit calmer now i'd actually still want to go a bit further still and where i'm sort of coming from is i would advocate resetting this completely if it's the rainbow we're trying to emphasize i'll show you how to do that really quickly so i'm going to actually with this layer remove it scary i'm going to create a new layer called in fact no that's not fair that's not what we're going to do we're going to leave the layer in but i'm just going to reset some of the tools that were in there 
um, instead because this mask is fine the mask is no issue I'm going to pull in the highlights because I want to see more detail in these textures out here in the mountains look at this it's fantastic all this detail and texture wonderful because it's detail and texture yes there's clarity in there but I also want to boost the structure a little bit as well maybe a bit of dehaze maybe back that away so that's still that's already looking a bit more natural now in here there is as I say there's a little tint of green creeping in somewhere which I kind of want to fix and up here we've got to deal with this blue so sky high I think it means highlights um, and that's got obviously in here all of this pulling down the whites and pulling down the highlights so that's helping with it but I actually want a high sky <laughs> layer so let's go on here and draw a new layer up here and I'm going to call it top of sky we're going to pull down our exposure we are going to pull up our saturation pull up our contrast maybe not quite so much exposure and we're going to stretch that a bit further so now I get a bit more definition at the top of the, the frame and it's done to disappear off the rainbow so let's click here and call it rainbow very easy with a really 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 soft brush so no hardness at all um, whether you use flow or opacity up to you but I'm just going to add into there that's pretty cool like that and then I'm going to use a luma range and try and get in to basically just around the rainbow so I'm just trying to get rid of bits that aren't part of the rainbow I'm hope I'm okay if it goes over because it's pretty rough I don't want this hill in there basically so I'll soften that up a little bit and hit apply fine I'm going to go into my grayscale mask and I'm going to right click on here and go to refine mask but before I'm going to rasterize it so I'm going to get rid of that luma range so now it's fixed I can't change the luma range again I can add a new one but I can't change it refine mask and I want Capture One to really think about this and go for more of the rainbow and smooth this mask out. Perfect. With this mask, change your clarity method to go to punch. Punch adds saturation. Add in your clarity. There's your rainbow. Now you can make it hyperdelic hyperdelic psychedelic whatever you want you can drop it down completely up to you you've now got control over your rainbow um i'm going to leave it pretty high up there and then i'm just going to use my eraser and just softly get rid of the bits to the side so i don't see that difference in clarity this method thing here everyone uses natural remember natural tries to do things really smoothly really calmly and tries to blend it into look natural hence the name if you are actively trying to increase the saturation on a layer through contrast use punch punch will add saturation as it's increasing the contrast structure we can add a little bit just be careful with noise dehaze up to you I wouldn't do it too much because it's going to differ too much from the rest of the the image but what you've now got in there with just that one layer just that one tool look at that from there to there there's your rainbow boost and don't boost it more than that next door to it I'm just going to be really really specific and say green to gray um, just as a mental note so I remember what that layer does and in here remember I've got a really soft brush in there and I'm going to go into my color editor advanced click in here it's going to be in that sort of yellowy green area so I'm going to include all of that and I'm just going to pull down saturation and look this starts to match then there I could also pull down lightness there and look at that layer look how different that now looks now if I don't like it hitting this top cloud I can just erase that layer a little bit perfectly fine so that to me would be the edit and if I go from there I think someone said it earlier it looks a bit radioactive sort of thing and, and, and I think they're right this feels like the rainbow is the star of the show beforehand the rainbow lost being the star of the show because of this I get the temptation to try and warm this stuff up if you want to you've got your sky high layer you can go on to your well we'll do it in advance actually we can go in to these colors here and we can increase the saturation a little bit little bit 
and decrease their lightness a little bit, not too much there. So, you know, that gets you your sort of glow, but from there to there, this one is now about the rainbow. This one was just around the, the bright colors everywhere. It's a bit confusing. Um, someone's just made, Joe, I think, yeah, crop the image, there's too much foreground. It depends. Um, it depends whether you're trying to show the player or player, which is down here. This is part of Death Valley. I mean, this is Death Valley. Um, or whether you're trying to show the sky. Um, if we wanted to, I, I don't disagree, by the way, but I'd, I'd maybe go to 16.9. Um, and let's see if we sort of put this point here on the one third line. So we go to there. Yeah, maybe that's a bit cleaner than there. Um, I'm, I'm not against the idea. That's not a bad idea. Um, what we could do is just put a, it's going to sound weird, but I'm going to put a layer in here with a gradient. And I'm going to, where's my eraser? I'm going to put 100% opacity, quite a small eraser, and I'm going to click here. Ah, yeah, sorry, rasterize it. So I'm going to click here because I had a gradient mask. Hold down the shift key and click over here. Make my eraser a bit bigger, and I can just delete everything up here with a nice big brush in a second now that I've done that. So this is how we get a sort of a weird half gradient um, if we really want to go for it uh, like that. And this will allow me, if I chose to, ooh, interesting, uh, this will allow me to pull up my exposure the further away we get from the camera, like that. So we go from there to there, and that gives me a lead up into that mountain range and that's where i get to so we go from there at the top to here at the bottom it's the same image it's the same picture there's nothing wrong with the exposure nothing wrong with the composition in that sense it's just making sure the focus is the rainbow this and not just this whole big splodge of color um this to me feels more inviting for a start but also more um more natural Okay, so I'll get rid of Joe's comment off the foreground because I've probably um, really confused people there. So those two in comparison, they look very similar. They are the same shot, but it's just about backing away and especially with that saturation. If you find yourself in the advanced color editor adding in colors all the way around the wheel, just use the normal saturation tool. If you, And if you think, well, I don't want everything to be saturated, then don't do that in the advanced editor either because that's what you're doing. You're just saturating everything and you're, you're losing the focus. The rainbow one, for those of you that want that sort of tip, um, punch as a method, nice soft mask, clarity up a little bit with punch, structure up a little bit, and you go from there, perfectly nice rainbow, to there, a bit more of a boom rainbow. Um, Brian, there's always one, isn't there? Is it straight? Uh, well, let's have a look at a guide. I think it is, actually. I'd say that's pretty straight. Um... Yeah, I think it's straight, Brian. But yes, it's a good check. If you're going to have a horizontal line, make sure it's a horizontal line. Okay, so that's us for today, pretty much. Um, so Mark's shot there with the rainbow. This one here from Igor, you know, just keep an eye on sectioning off those areas, especially if you're lucky enough where what you want to do with the midtones versus the highlights versus the shadows, if they all do sit in different areas on that wheel then genuinely use the fact that you've got those different areas separated to change the colors. So you can have bluer water, you can have warmer sky, you can have darker um, foregrounds, but use the, the color editor and the color balance tool to do it. Dust spot tool, please do, please, please, please. For those of you that are using it, please send in your results and your raw files into Capture One. They can only improve things if you tell them what it is they need to improve and the things that are frustrating you. So please do send them in, use it. Um, in the meantime, between now and next month's session, so next month's live session, remember we have 
The last masterclass we did, there will be a new one announced over the next week, but the last masterclass we did was the color grading one for landscape styles. You'll find the details for that in the description. There's a load of previous masterclasses as well that you can also join that will give you specific stuff around um, some of the things and how we shoot. Between now and the next session, you can join in um, the conversation piece on the Facebook group. For those of you that aren't into Facebook, not a problem. Like I said earlier, you can find out when the next session is in either our website, so poorreefer.com slash workshops and then go into live online sessions or on the YouTube channel. If you subscribe to it, it will show you um, when the next one's coming up. Between now and then, send in your images on poorreeferlive.wetransfer.com. If you don't include your name, we cannot include your image, but please ensure you send a raw if possible and we can have a little play and try and help you with any issues you've got. And finally, thankfully, he's going to stop talking in a second. Um, that's how to get in touch with us so if you want to or if you need to if you want to either follow or communicate or whatever contact us um those are different ways so between now and then look after yourselves and we'll see you in a month cheers everyone bye bye